HBCU Digest Radio, continuing our conversation with distinguished leaders from historically black colleges and universities. And we are finishing up a conversation with a historic moment today uh, down in the AUC. Uh, you just heard a conversation with Morehouse College President David Thomas. And now we are joined by the distinguished president of Spelman College, Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell. And this is her first time on the show. So we are indeed honored uh, by, by Madam President's presence. So thank you so much, Dr. Campbell, for making time today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so, you know, it goes without saying this is this is huge uh, for the college, but certainly not foreign for Spelman. Uh, no stranger to to big philanthropic support. Uh, tell us a little bit about the reaction of the campus, the Spelman community around this gift. I know it came as a surprise to a lot of folks, uh, but it would it would appear that this was something in the making. Uh, talk to us just about the sense of the gift and, and how people are reacting and how it came to fruition. So, so first, let me say, um, this is a historic gift for Spelman. This is the largest scholarship gift the college has ever had in the history of the college. So this, w this was quite something for us. Um, we, this, the gift came as a complete surprise to us, although I will say we had um, uh, met Patty Quillen and Reed Hastings about a year and a half ago. Um, Michael Lomax, who's the head of, of UNCF, brought them to the Atlanta University Center, gave them a tour. Um, my board chair and I had an opportunity to have dinner with him. And it was during that dinner that I was really struck by the fact that here was um, the CEO of a major company who had a real commitment to educational equity. Um, he had been on the board of KIPP, uh, for many years, he was he was real clear about what the issues were and the nature of the disparities uh, between uh, black communities and white communities in this country, and the need to close those gaps. So it, it, it was a it was a wonderful opportunity to meet him and his wife. And uh, shortly after that, we got a gift from them, and then a year later, another gift. So they they had been donors to the college. And they and while they were there, they said that one of the things that really struck them the most were, were the students. They were just so bowled over by um, our, our students and and the fact of their how much they appreciated what being at an HBCU meant to them, and that stayed with them. And um, I think the gift grew out of that under deeper understanding. It's it's hard to to imagine this gift um, as as separate and apart from what's going on socially, not just here in the United States, but around the world. Uh, you know, as our communities continue to to wrestle with and and deal with you know the lynching of George Floyd, and you particularly had some powerful comments about what it, what is the role of of Spelman and what is the role of Spelman women at a time like this. And so when you when you think about the ways that corporate America and a lot of other structural institutional you know bodies in the country are saying you know maybe we got to start listening maybe we got to do something different is there any kind of dissonance or any kind of separation that you make as a president and as a citizen to say yeah that yes good good spellman deserves this but we know that this is in the midst of of the country trying to lurch towards a better understanding of race and not oppressing black americans yeah so, so it's funny i i i uh you know, this country has been lurching for a long time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, HBC came into being after we lurched out of a civil war. And we had literally millions of African Americans who uh, needed to be educated, and there were no institutions that would do that. Spelman was, was designed, the Atlanta Baptist Female Seminary was designed to educate black women here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the, you know, during the Jim Crow era, we kind of lurched again. And, and this is where black women who had high aspirations and real dreams and ambitions for themselves would come, uh, come to. And I, we named this scholarship, the Dovey Johnson Roundtree um, Scholarship, after a Spelman alumna who graduated in 1938. 
and went on to become a, 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 a pioneering civil rights attorney. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the civil during the civil rights movement, we lurched again, and you know, women like Marion Wright Edelman and Rosalind Pope, who wrote the you know was the main author for the uh, human rights statement that was issued here a- in Atlanta. Um, you know, came out of that. So here, you know, here here we are yet again in one of those moments where the country seems to have to wake itself up, mm-hmm. and. Uh, Patty and Reed have been very, very forthright in saying that this moment is what inspired them to make a gift of this scale. Um, I, we just spent yesterday three hours in interviews with them, with, and, in which uh, Reed made that statement over and over again, that um, they had been making those, these modest gifts, and when they first called us, they said the gift was going to be for $20 million, mm-hmm. which I thought was fantastic. I thought, oh, my gosh, what an incredible gift. This is an I knew. He called my board chair, and I thought oh, we were celebrating. The day after, Patty sent another, an, an email and said, you know what? We've decided we have to do more. Mm-hmm. And they upped it to $40 million. Mm-hmm. And so there's no question but that this moment has has given given them them a sense of urgency, and it's their their hope that in fact this their leadership gift will inspire others like it. So I I think this is a very important statement for them to make, not only for HBCUs and for you know particularly Morehouse and Spelman, but it was a statement for them to make to their peers. And so um, hopefully it's a moment when their peers are going to be able to hear that statement. Let's let's talk about that a little bit because Spelman and Morehouse and, and Spelman in particular has done very, very well in terms of maintaining relationships with corporate partners and individuals with, with you know, sizable wealth to make them recurring partners and donors, right? And so there's, it's yeah. not just, you know, take this 20 million out, uh, uh, goodbye, good luck. You know, there there's a, there's a <laughs> constant, there's a constant, continuum of let's talk about how you can make things happen for these sisters on campus. Let's talk about how some of our programs right. can establish stronger equity in the corporate environment, in the scientific environment. How does Spelman, obviously you're, you're at the center of that and your board is at the center of that, but how do you outside of the leadership structure say, here's how an institution fosters that partnership. If that's even, if that's even a thing. So I, I think it happens. I, I think what I love about Spelman College is that, that this is a community where everybody um, participates in leadership. And um, so it doesn't just happen with our trustees, although our trustees do a spectacular job. This is, I have the most, one of the most incredible boards I've ever seen in my life. Um, and it doesn't just happen with the leadership, although we, I think that our leadership team here is absolutely first rate. Mm-hmm. But it happens with the faculty. The faculty have relationships with corporations and they're getting to a conversation and they will lead them to the campus and lead them to, to our students. Our students will be at uh, a research institute or, or uh, doing an internship somewhere and they'll inspire the people around them to then, in fact, come and talk to the, the college more. We have alumni who are, I mean, our alumni, this is, just the most the hardest working alumni you can possibly imagine Mm -hmm. it's like their job is to be on the lookout for Spelman College so over the years over the 139 years of this college we have created this um, dynamic community where everybody who's a member of it faculty staff students alumni trustees feels that it's their responsibility to be vigilant on behalf of Spelman. And so I think it's that all-in feeling that, that makes Spelman feel like people always say, oh, you're such a rich community, rich organization. I say, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're healthy. Right, right, right. We're healthy, but we're not wealthy. But we are very rich in human capital. Yes. And so I, I, I think it says that you, you know, if that can make a difference. Now, I will very quickly say we would love to have that human capital 
matched by financial capital. Mm-hmm. That's right. Because <laughs> I think you really do, to be very, very uh, honest, you really have to have both. Let me let me shift back to the conversation about the, the culture change that's going on, right? So we, we talked to Dr. Thomas mm-hmm. about this, and I will ask you, Usually there are, there are trends that take place in fundraising, particularly in higher education. You know, some years ago it was STEM. Mm-hmm. We got to get more scientists and, mm-hmm. and engineers. Let's train them up. Let's give money towards that. At some point, it's been the same for education. At some point, it'll be that for arts. Now we need people who can communicate. Mm-hmm. We need people who can inspire. Now we're in an era where it's, you know, we need people who can activate the best of our angels in racial justice and and and, and autonomy are you concerned that this era, this moment right now, with the money that will be flowing in and around it, may come to Spelman in a way and say, you know what, I want I want Spelman to make 50 black women police chiefs when that's not all that Spelman does. Are are you concerned about that? And how do you how do you kind of respond to the and I don't want to call it this, but the flavor of the month of saying let's let's build racial equity in the country. So I, I think that one of the things that I, I think has emerged during this era is um, a new brand of leadership. And that leadership is youthful. Mm-hmm. And that leadership is not acquiescent. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it speaks up and stands up for uh, what it believes in. And uh, one, one of the things that ha- has happened is this, this um, moment has opened up where we are speaking with an authority in a way that encourages our white brothers and sisters to pay close attention to what we say we need. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so I, I, I think that um, I, I think I see that as a shift, and that's different from the civil rights movement. I, 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 I think that is something, although the civil rights movement also was a very young movement. I mean, we forget that, you know, King was, was 39 years old when he was assassinated and very young when he started, you know, the Montgomery bus boycott. Right. But, you know, that was a youthful movement as well, as was the Black Power movement that, that came after it. Mm-hmm. So I think that, that this, every, you know, this lurking this time is, is, is a new, a young voice, but a new, uh, a new script for that young voice. Uh, in a way that's saying, you know what, you thought you had all the answers, but you have missed it. And we're going to tell you what has been happening in our community. And I think those leaders, corporate, philanthropic, government leaders, I mean, I, you know, I, local and state governments have risen in their um, authority, I think, during this crisis. Because it sure isn't happening at the federal level, mm-hmm. um, to uh, really say, you know what? Let's let's pay very close attention. And so I think that this is a moment where we institutions, HBCUs, Black cultural organizations, all, all of us have to make clear what we think needs to change. As an educator, from my perspective. I think investments like the one that Patty and Reed have made need to be greater, a greater number. I think there should be more people like them who are eager to make the kinds of investments that they made. What do you what do you think about the the notion of and this is particular for Spelman Morehouse, too, but, but mostly because black women are, are unafraid Um, and undaunted by speaking up and speaking out uh, even more so than the brothers in a lot of ways and that's always been the case Um, (laughs) I'll let you say that (laughs) well you know I'm one of the the lesser ones so I can say that proudly but I I would say you know because sisters are always willing to be out in front of the conversation and eager to lead it um, Mm -hmm. as they should Mm -hmm. be do you worry even in the era of you know social distancing and we're not quite sure what this what the campus community is going to look like in the fall that this is so heavy and so pressing right now that students will say, you know what, I, maybe I got to take a semester off because this is this is drawing my attention now. Or even the students that come back saying, you know, I want Spelman to do more. We got a lot of stuff we got to work on and this is not business as usual. Do you think that 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 is a cause for concern or cause for opportunity 
for the for the college to say, yes, we can do some things or we can reimagine the way that we coalesce students and institution around issues. So I think this is what I would call a disruptive moment. And you can't have business as usual when you've had a disruption. Mm -hmm. And and you can you can you know, a disruptive moment can be unsettling, it can be disturbing, it can be disorienting. And it has been all of that for our students. But it also is a, a creative opportunity because because if you can't think if you can't do things the way you've always done you have an opportunity to think creatively about how you can do them differently and better and more effectively. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is, where, this is a time when leadership is called on to create some space for people, for students to come forward and say, you know what, have we ever thought about this? Or to have faculty say, you know what, I think we ought to do, or staff to say, we, we need to have a, a place for our community to have a conversation in the, ne in the coming weeks about what is it that Spellman is, in what way is Spellman uniquely positioned to make an impact in this historic moment? And then the last thing, this is totally unfair, and I preface my question <laughs> by asking this. The success of Spellman and the success of Morehouse and Howard to an extent in terms of philanthropic support over the last two to four years has started uh -huh. kind of an undercurrent conversation about a possible and growing, really, wealth distribution gap between th these schools and some of the other ones. And that's totally unfair to you. And like I told Dr. Thomas, and I will tell you, you got to take care of Spellman. Everybody gets it. But how do you answer the question if somebody asks you, is it fair for Spellman to be so prolific at attracting support when Savannah State or Fort Valley is struggling? It, it does that. How do you, how do you answer that? Because in a way it is fair. It is fair to ask that, but it's unfair to ask it to you <laughs> because you're doing your job. So how, how do you kind of confront that that growing reality, particularly among the students who are asking that question more than anybody? Right. And, and students are asking that question, and they have every right to ask that question. I think the responsibility that we have, cer certainly, um, I'll, I'll speak for myself. Mm -hmm. I think the responsibility that Spellman has is to make sure that as we are telling the Spellman narrative, we are telling it as a narrative of HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I really respected the way Patty and Reed have made this gift and the way they talk about it. Because he begins with his conversations with Michael Lomax, who, you know, as the head of UNCF, represents 37 of our HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And he says, Michael educated me about the value and the role that HBCUs play in our community. So I decided to make, because he made the gift to three places, I decided to make $40 million of my gift to UNCF, mm -hmm. which ultimately will go to, in some way, shape, or form, yeah, the those other right, HBCUs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then individually to Spelman and Morehouse. So, so it is extremely important that when one of us gets some success, we use the opportunity, we use the platform, the bully pulpit, the time, the five minutes we have on TV to also celebrate other HBCUs. Xavier, no one, no one creates more African American medical professionals than Xavier University. Um, Prairie View uh, educates some phenomenal number of black engineers. I mean, all you can just go through, you know, Fisk has an astrophysicist program that is um, nationally renowned. I mean, there, there is, there's so much richness among HBCUs. And, and what we need to do is celebrate the victories of, of the ones that are, 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 have, have something to celebrate and encourage other people to make more victories for all of us.